this meeting. We're very pleased to have Deputy Secretary of the Treasury Robert Kimmett with us tonight. Uh, Secretary Kimmett will be talking on the challenge of investment protectionism. I've been cautioned by the CFR staff repeatedly not to read Bob's bio. All of you were supposed to have studied that before you got here. If you didn't, you should leave now because you're not following the rules. Uh, some housekeeping. This meeting is part of the C. Peter McCullough series on international economics. And the series is presented by the Council's corporate program as well as the Maurice R. Greenberg Center for Geoeconomic Studies. And our next McCullough uh, lecture will be with Peter Mandelson, the EU Trade Commissioner, on Monday, September 17th. We're very pleased to have Secretary Kimmett here. Obviously, the issue of uh, investment protectionism is very timely, including something out of Russia just in the last a day or so. And uh, this is something which I think we should all have a very keen interest in, in terms of uh, uh, not only going forward, but the state of political discussion here in the States. I would like to remind the audience that this meeting is on the record. There are people from the press in the room. You are all on your guard. And uh, please remember to turn off your cell phones, Blackberries, and other wireless devices. I promise to personally embarrass you if your phone goes off while Secretary Kimmett is speaking. Bob, over to you. I've lost my wire, so I'm assuming that these uh, mics are working, and I'll put the wire back on for the uh, Q&A. Um, let me start, if I could, with three words of thanks. Uh, first, to the Council for organizing uh, this event uh, this evening. Uh, second, Chuck, to you for moderating. Uh, and third, to all of you for attending, especially on a day that carries so many memories, uh, especially for those of us who are in New York City uh, on that fateful morning six years ago. When I was getting ready to go to Germany as ambassador, my predecessor gave me only one bit of advice. He said, never forget how important speeches are to the Germans. He said they love to give speeches, listen to speeches, and analyze speeches far more than is the case in the United States. Dick Walters stood up one time before a distinguished group like this, gave 40 minutes of what he considered prime oratory in German, sat down rather pleased with himself, only to have the Chuck Prince of that evening stand up and say, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for those wonderful remarks. We would welcome you back anytime you have a moment for a real speech. Well, by that measure, you're barely getting remarks tonight because the agreement with the council is I was going to start maybe with about 15 minutes of informal remarks, uh, and then uh, we'll sit down and begin the dialogue. There are three important elements of a successful and sound world economy, free trade, flexible exchange rates, and the free flow of capital across borders. But there's considerably more attention that has been paid to the first two parts of that uh, important triad, and that is free trade and flexible exchange rates. And they are certainly important. Progress on the Doha round, quite interesting that you have Peter Mandelson here next week. Progress on the four bilateral trade agreements we have um, uh, negotiated. Is, is very important, both for the domestic and the world economy. Certainly, exchange rate issues are important, not least the Chinese currency. But I will say that finance ministries, policy makers, indeed policy-oriented organizations like the Council, in my view, need to devote increased attention to the question of the free flow of capital across borders based on open investment policies because in the end, that free flow of capital is the lifeblood of the world economy. If you just take a look at foreign direct investment in the United States, it is responsible for over 5 million jobs. While that's only 4% of our workforce, those uh, 5 million FDI-sponsored jobs comprise 10% uh, of our capital investment, 
fifteen percent of our annual research and development twenty percent of our exports and interestingly a full thirty percent of those jobs are in manufacturing whereas less than ten percent of the overall american workforce is in manufacturing but very often the investment discussion indeed perceptions are based much more on the relatively few controversial investment decisions rather than on fact uh, the controversy I first recall began back in the mid 1970s indeed when the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States was set up by executive order by President Ford then it was going to be Saudi recycled petrodollars that would be the ruin of the US and the world economy it was Japanese investment in the 1980s that led to the Exxon Florio amendment which provided the statutory basis for the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US and obviously more recently uh, we've had cases like the Chinese National Overseas Oil Company in 2005 and Dubai Ports World in 2006 that have very much seemed to define the public perception both at home and abroad of US investment policy I think many people think that the US reviews almost every cross-border acquisition and blocks many of them in fact the facts are very different in calendar 2006 so the same year of the Dubai ports controversy there were over 10,000 M&A transactions in the United States of those 1730 were cross-border transactions foreign acquirers taking ownership or control of a US asset of those 1730 uh, cross-border M&A transactions only 113 came before the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US so roughly 5% none of those was blocked by the committee I point that out because again I think the perception is that many more cases come before us uh, and many more cases have difficulty some do have difficulty some raise legitimate security concerns and those need to be addressed but those are decidedly the exception rather than the rule this year in 2007 there have been three significant recent developments first in May of this year President Bush issued the first open investment policy statement in over 15 years secondly at the G8 summit in Haligandam in June there was the first major statement by the G8 on the importance of investment flows to the world economy and third in July of this year a new bipartisan US investment review law was passed by the Congress and signed by the president this bipartisan bill strikes the balance between encouraging investment that produces American jobs but also protecting national security it clears up many of the ambiguities in the previous law it gets the relationship right between the Congress and the administration it makes clear the criteria to identify those cases that require particular uh, attention uh, from the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US we think it's important to get this word out not only because investment flows swamp trade flows in terms of volume um, and breadth uh, but also because we are seeing a growing tendency toward investment protectionism around the world uh, we think that we have struck the right balance between welcoming investment and protecting national security and we've done that by keeping our investment barriers low and again identifying just that small number of cases that raise security concerns again that's one of the reasons I'm here tonight talking to this important group and traveling elsewhere in the world as Chuck said I think we may need a stop in Moscow where Mr. Putin seems to think that the new law is tougher than the previous law I would say that it is a refinement of the previous law that picks up on the experience since 1988 and the rather dramatic world in which we live um, rather than uh, changing dramatically the balance that we try to strike as we do investment reviews but as I say the trend elsewhere is toward uh, higher barriers raising real concerns about the prospects for rising investment protection we have seen just in the past year either 
um, old investment laws updated or new investment laws passed or proposed in countries ranging from Russia to China to Japan, India, Canada, Germany, and indeed quite a bit of discussion, Peter Mandelson being one of the key discussants on this, of what the European Union and Commission itself should do. In Germany, um, explicitly and elsewhere implicitly, one of the reasons for concern and one of the bases for a call for new barriers is because of the emergence of sovereign wealth funds as a factor both in the world economy and in the investment arena in particular. Let me uh, say a few words about sovereign wealth, and we can pick this up a bit more during um, the question and answer period if you wish. First, sovereign wealth is not a new phenomenon. Um, sovereign wealth funds have been around for over four decades and have largely been a force for good because of their record of patient long-term investing based on commercial uh, factors. However, the older sovereign wealth funds in places like the Persian Gulf, Singapore, and Norway have now been joined by similar funds in China, Russia, and elsewhere. The estimates are that currently sovereign wealth uh, held in these sovereign wealth funds could be as high as $2 trillion and over the next uh, seven to ten years could grow to over $10 trillion. Even though today and in the future, assuming um, comparable global growth, these funds are a relatively small proportion of global wealth, they are now of a size and significance that attention uh, and vigilance are appropriate. Inside the U.S. government, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, Jamil Henry used to play an important role in before he left us at Treasury, uh, is taking a leading role to make sure that our regulatory structure and system uh, is appropriate to uh, the task of addressing uh, sovereign wealth funds both now and in the future. The President's Working Group includes Treasury, uh, the Federal Reserve, SEC, the Commodities Futures Trading Corporation, and the bank regulators. Externally, uh, discussion has begun. Indeed, some discussions took place today in the G7. It will also be on the G8 uh, summit agenda in the G20, a relatively new financial grouping since the crises of the late 90s, and also APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, has had discussions on this subject uh, recently. We have suggested that there's an important role for the IMF and the World Bank to play working with sovereign wealth funds on guidelines or best practices, including around issues like governance and transparency. The IMF particularly has done good work through the years on reserve management. We see this as an extension of the good work that's been done by the IMF. We've also suggested that the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, in Paris, could play an important role working with nations receiving inbound investment from sovereign wealth funds, develop ways to review such investment consistent with open investment policies and the lowest possible barriers. I might note that the new U.S. law that passed in July of this year uh, gives us some guidance on how to deal with investments from state-owned and controlled uh, organizations, including sovereign wealth funds. Um, it makes some adjustments to the previous law where there had been some uh, questions about the length of the review that was required, the level of approval that was required. But essentially now, any inbound investment from um, a uh, foreign uh, government uh, owned and controlled entity, including sovereign wealth funds, would have to be approved by the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. and then has to have the personal sign-off, either the Secretary of the Treasury or myself, um, after uh, an investigation. But I will say that sovereign wealth fund investments, indeed foreign-owned and controlled investments, are not new to the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. Since it was statutorily authorized almost 20 years ago, uh, we have had about 200 such cases come before the committee. 
In recent years, those numbers have picked up. There were actually 19 such cases that came before the Committee on Foreign Investment in 2006. So we're seeing some uptick in what had been an average of about 10 per year to closer to 20 per year. Uh, we know how to deal with these, again, from a security review perspective. And we would encourage others, as they set up their review regimes, uh, to uh, perhaps draw from some of the experience that we've had. I expect that there will be a significant discussion on this point at the IMF World Bank meetings uh, in October. Again, uh, the various organizations that I've mentioned, uh, both the IMF and the World Bank, uh, G7 and 8, and other key finance ministers, central bank governors, and indeed representatives of all the sovereign wealth funds, as well as many representatives from the private sector, will be there. I think a good time uh, to take this discussion forward. Let me just summarize by saying that we in the United States are open to investment from abroad. We are open to it because it is good for the U.S. economy, it's good for the world economy, it creates good, productive American jobs, and we want to send a clear signal that we're open to investment. At the same time, no public servant has a higher, or every public servant has no higher responsibility than protecting the national security, and in each case, we will look to make sure that the national security is protected uh, even as we review cases against this open investment policy. We respect the rights of others, obviously, to uh, set up their own investment review regimes. What we would suggest is they can be done in a way that keeps barriers low and still protects national security. We look forward to working both bilaterally within the OECD and other organizations as countries in Europe and elsewhere uh, advance work on their review legislation. And I would say that we recognize that sovereign wealth is a very important part of this debate. As I said, uh, it is an issue that requires vigilance on our part, but I think it's also an, an issue that should be approached with calmness, uh, collectively, and collaboratively uh, to find the way to move forward to a world economy that's even stronger and indeed, in the end, what are sovereign wealth funds trying to do but to improve their returns without generating political controversy? That's got to be good for the world economy. I think working collaboratively toward that goal should be the touchstone of what we do over the course of the next year. I think I'll stop there and uh, look forward to your questions. I now have the great privilege of uh, starting off the discussions with a couple of questions. Um, those are very, very, uh, I guess those meet the Jeff German definition of at least remarks and probably a speech based on. Just remarks. Uh, two questions just to get started, if I may. I wonder if on the, on the subject of sovereign wealth funds, I wonder if there is some change in at least perception that in the past, you mentioned sovereign wealth funds go back quite a ways, whether some or most of those previous sovereign wealth funds were or were seen to be with governments more allied with the United States in a geopolitical sense. And I wonder if there is at least the perception that some of the newer sovereign wealth funds, perhaps some of the rapidly growing ones, might represent a, a political alliance not so closely tied to U.S. Uh, uh, interests or, or outlooks? Um, I think that's certainly a factor, Chuck. There's, there's no question about it. Um, I would say, however, that we would like to think that these sovereign wealth funds are going to be making their decisions, as I said, on commercial bases rather than for political reasons. Um, also, while you mentioned some of the older sovereign wealth funds that perhaps were somewhat more aligned with the U.S., some of them have run into issues, as the uh, Dubai ports people found, indeed, as the Saudis found decades ago. Um, I think, however, pursuing um, investments and, indeed, pursuing management of the funds on a sound commercial basis uh, should help obviate some of those political concerns so that these are seen as commercial economic financial vehicles rather than political vehicles. 
perhaps on a, on a related topic to, to your uh, answer there, I wonder if, um, if part of the dialogue, at least in the States, I, I see this rising protectionism on investments all around the world, and you listed a number of countries, but I see it in, in, in almost every country uh, around the world. I wonder if in the States, part of the dialogue reflects the political season. Uh, we are in an election season. Uh, they seem to be longer and longer. And I wonder if part of the discussion now reflects, a, a, a at some level, a, a pandering to uh, to scare tactics. A, a let's scare people into this or that. And if there is some of that, or perhaps some of that, what what might we look to beyond the election cycle? That is, what what within that larger spectrum of discussion is long-term U.S. interests, uh, and and how should we? think about the level of dialogue, whether it reflects accurately or in a puffed up way, uh, what people are truly thinking in, a, in, in Washington. Um, uh, I'm with you. I, I think we've seen the end of the end of election cycles. I think we're <laughs> in a, a period of, of perpetual election cycles. Um, I personally have not seen <coughs> partisan politics creep into this particular debate. The concerns about investment have tended through the years to be bipartisan concerns. Um, again, I think that we at the Treasury Department, other finance ministries, other departments and agencies, as well as the private sector, and indeed investors, need to do a better job of telling the positive story about investment. It, it's usually quite welcome at the state and local level <clears throat> and greeted with greater skepticism at the federal level. And I think what that means is we've got to help tell the story, some facts of which um, I tried to put out tonight. I'll tell you a very personal view. We talk about foreign direct investment. I think one of the real problems is the word foreign. Hmm. When Americans hear the word foreign, they have a natural tendency to tense up. Ever since Washington's farewell speech, w warning us about foreign entanglements. I'm old enough now uh, to remember when we used to talk about foreign trade. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about foreign trade anymore. It's now just trade or international trade. But that word foreign direct investment, I think as soon as someone hears it, or foreign investment, is almost a negative that has to be disproved. So one of the things we're trying to do at the Treasury Department is move away from the F word. One last question, if I can. That F word, yes. Uh, one last question, if I can. Um, uh, uh, and a complicated one. Um, much of the political discussion uh, these days is occupied by uh, front page kinds of issues, whether it's uh, the uh, war in Iraq or immigration or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in that context, uh, there is a perception, correct or not, that the administration is either a little weakened or is perhaps uh, focused in ways uh, uh, necessarily perhaps in terms of these issues. How much of that perception impacts the ability of the Treasury Department or you to, to effectively deal with foreign governments, that is outside of the U.S., outside of the current political dialogue, is, is there any sense of a lessening of attention or, or waiting for the political process to come to a resolution that would make this a more complicated or a more delayed kind of discussion? This meaning the investment yes, discussion? Yes, yeah. I, I think I haven't seen that at all in the investment area, not least because we have investment decisions being made every day and review decisions being made every day. Foreign direct investment in 2006 uh, rose to $161 billion, the highest since 2006. So investors still want to invest in this great economy, uh, and therefore I don't think they can wait till January of 2009. Uh, and frankly, I think that their governments, when it comes to investment policy, recognizing the centrality of the U.S. market, are always open to engagement with us. Um, this is not the first time that I've served in the last couple of years in the administration. I was in the last uh, two years of the second Reagan term, also at the Treasury Department, in your former profession as a lawyer. Uh, during that time, <coughs> we uh, did the Plaza and Liver Accords. Um, we got tax reform. Um, and we also passed the first major bilateral free trade agreement with Canada, negotiated in 87, passed in 88. 
Um, so I think particularly in the areas of foreign policy, including foreign economic policy, uh, there's still a recognition uh, overseas that the president and the administration uh, retain considerable inherent authority. Uh, it has not been an inhibitor on what we've been trying to do at the Treasury Department. But I'm not saying it's not a factor more broadly, mm -hmm. uh, including perhaps in my former place of employee at the State Department and so forth. It requires creativity. It requires an initiative. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's hard to think of any major development in the world, whether it be in the political security or economic area, uh, that it is not going to involve the United States in some fashion. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, at this time, let me invite the members present to join in this dialogue. And a couple of uh, ground rules, please. First, please wait for the microphone. And it says speak directly into it. If I have to tell you to speak into the microphone, you shouldn't be here. Please uh, stand, state your name and affiliation, and please, please, please limit yourself to one question and keep it concise so that as many people as possible can speak. Yes, sir. Herbert Levin, could you please uh, describe for us the operation of these funds? Uh, do they have the money abroad and they give it to Lehman Brothers to invest? Do they open an office here and do it all themselves? Is there any pattern? How have they operated? Uh, do you see some methods of operation more problematic than others? Um, it varies from fund to fund. Um, I would say the majority of the funds right now uh, use professional fund managers to do quite a bit of their um, uh, investment. Some, however, do direct investment uh, themselves, uh, either uh, minority positions in companies or sometimes actually buying majority control uh, of assets. Um, I think one of the reasons that I mentioned that it would be good for the IMF to look at issues like transparency is that I believe as these funds grow in size and have a potential for greater effect on the global economy, uh, some additional transparency would be helpful. And I think if you look at the Norway Fund, for example, um, it, it's a good example of a fund that um, has been successful. Um, but uh, has set a very good standard both on governance, transparency, and other issues. Over on the far side here. Uh, yes, I'm Jim Zirin from uh, Sidley Austin, your former place of employment. Uh, one of many. <laughs> one, one, uh, I wondered, do you suppose the administration and or CFIUS uh, would handle the Dubai ports deal or a deal like that any differently from the way that it was, in fact, handled, and if so, in what respect? Sure. Um, the, I, I would say that the security review done by the um, security professionals in the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. Um, was done on a very sound basis. Uh, six departments and agencies, six White House offices were involved in that review. You had you know, 12 people signing off that they did not see uh, a security concern. Um, under the new law and indeed in procedures that we've put in place since Dubai ports, uh, the decision would not have stopped there. They would have had to uh, bring that up to get uh, a political level sign off, at least at the assistant secretary level. And because in that case it was a state owned and controlled um, uh, entity, it would have required a sign off uh, at a higher level, secretary or, or deputy secretarial level. So we would have elevated the approval process inside the administration. That would have given us the opportunity to engage the Congress earlier on the issue. Uh, but I don't think we would have had to engage the Congress um, on our own. You will find that uh, one of the lessons out of Dubai ports is the companies uh, are very quick to bring in both local politicians and uh, key legislators into the process early on. Um, the same uh, Dubai investment entity that had the problem in Dubai ports has made subsequent successful acquisitions, recognizing now that they need to spend roughly commensurate amounts of time on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, working both with the Congress uh, and with the administration. One of the um, uh, restrictions that we had in early 2006 that remains today, for good reason, 
is that there are very strict limits on what we can do with the sensitive proprietary information that we get from companies. I have found, as a general matter, in my years in government, we're very good at protecting sensitive company proprietary information. I wish sometimes we could be as good on classified information. Mm -hmm. But we're very good about protecting company information. As a result, there is a real limit on what we can share with the Congress, but no limit on what the company can share with the Congress. And especially for new entrants into the CFIUS process now, one of the first things we do is suggest to them and their advisors uh, that they make sure that they have an engagement process uh, both with the Congress and with state and local officials. So again, we would elevate it uh, inside the administration. We would engage to the extent that we could with the Congress. But I think one of the real lessons learned by the companies is that they too need to engage beyond the executive branch. Just to follow up to that question, was there anything in the CFIUS legislation that was finally passed and signed that you wished had gotten in that didn't get in? in terms of the effectiveness of the process going forward? No, at the end, uh, the bill that was passed uh, under the leadership of Barney Frank in the House, Spencer Backus, uh, Chris Dodd, and uh, Richard Shelby in the Senate, I think um, was um, a collaborative bipartisan effort. And this was an area that needed collaboration and bipartisanship. Um, we now are going through the process of putting out regulations and implementing procedures. There'll be some back and forth on that. Uh, but I think the legislation struck just the right balance. Good. Okay. Let's see, right here, please. I'm Charles Antoine Waters from Cleary Gottlieb Law Firm. Um, we hear a lot about uh, sovereign wealth funds because of the huge amounts they have to invest. But um, do we also see a move in the assets that they are targeting? So um, are they moving into more strategic assets? And also what would be your definition of what a strategic asset should be and requiring a review of um, the committee? Thank you. The, the strategic asset approach is one that has been used by the French and is the approach uh, laid out in the legislation before the Russian Duma at this point. It's not an approach that we take. Uh, again, what we have is um, a committee made up of members from six departments and agencies, White House offices, each of whom brings to the table uh, a particular perspective on that part of the national security equation for which they have responsibility. We have some guidelines laid down in the law, particularly close look at energy assets, critical infrastructure, state owned and controlled. Uh, but really it's, it's that collegial approach that helps um, uh, strike the right national security balance for that time and moment. I don't think we're going to see this legislation revised again for years to come. So one of the things I think the legislators did quite well is left some flexibility. So you'll see that we don't designate those strategic sectors. Um, uh, as to what the sovereign wealth funds are doing, again, going back to the first question, there are some who never take majority ownership and control. Uh, there are others for whom that is the preferred preference. It, it really uh, uh, varies from fund to fund. Um, I will tell you, in, in my discussions um, in China in July, um, although I was sitting across from government officials who were heading what was then going to be called the State Foreign Exchange Investment Company, I think they're now going to call it the China Investment Company. Um, although these were government officials, um, I felt as though I was talking to professional asset managers across the table. Um, they made very clear that their goal was to generate higher returns without generating political controversy and that therefore they were not looking to move into ownership or control stakes. And if you take a look at some of the decisions that they've made since that time, uh, they've been true to that philosophy. So again, I think it will um, uh, be up to each sovereign wealth fund remembering that each is sovereign, to make their own uh, investment decision. My recollection of the Norway fund that I mentioned is that they take no more than 5% in any uh, one holding any one company. Again, there's a variance across the, uh, the spectrum. Yes. Uh, John Beatty from uh, UBS. Uh, for several years, there's been a prohibition on uh, foreign, own, foreign airlines acquiring a majority share in U.S. domestic airlines. 
I can understand, uh, this is for na national security concerns. I can understand why this would make sense in the case of aircraft manufacturers, say, for example, Boeing, uh, because they have access to sensitive technologies. However, for airlines which are solely transporting passengers to and across uh, the U.S., um, is there really a justifiable national security consideration? And if so, is this outweighed by the significant potential benefits that would accrue, uh, for example, uh, significant cap capital infusions from such uh, foreign uh, airlines? Uh, really good question. Um, if, if I could, I'd start by saying that um, there are surprisingly few statutory restrictions on foreign direct investment in the United States. I, I would challenge someone to point out any country that has fewer statutory restrictions than we. Media, which Steve would know well. Airlines, you've pointed out. And then there are some things on barge operators, uh, nuclear power operators, but they're really relatively small in number. You've pointed out one of them, uh, airlines. Um, we in the administration have taken the position that we don't think that that cap on uh, foreign ownership is good policy. Uh, but again, it's not policy, it's law. Uh, and therefore, we've been working um, with the Congress uh, to try to modify that law. There have been some recent agreements, particularly the EU-US Air Transport Agreement, that have gone as far as the law would require. I think there were some pledges by the US in that agreement although I was not the negotiator, to try to continue to see what flexibility we could get. But that is one of the statutory bars. There are national security arguments made, but there are a range of other arguments made. But the administration on that one has been clear. Uh, we think that cap should be list, uh, lifted. If there are national security considerations, we can review those on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we don't think the absolute statutory bar uh, is, is in the best economic interest of the U.S. Richard? My name is Richard Haas, and I work at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Bob, what's your thinking about a WTO-like institution here that would set up a rules-based system governing investment and a mechanism for adjudicating areas where governments or companies and governments disagree? And might it not be a useful safeguard either against congressionally imposed protectionism that you don't want to see? or against either behavior by sovereign funds you don't want to see, or protectionism in other countries that would block U.S. origin for direct investment? Um, as you've been doing for 20 years, you're sort of one step ahead of my thinking. Um, I think it's a very interesting idea. But before we get there, we have to face the fact that investment right now sort of belongs to every agency of the U.S. government. It belongs to many directorates inside the commission. And as with any important topic that belongs to everybody, you don't get that concerted effort uh, that you need. And I think both in the US government and in the international community, um, we have to start looking at investment not as a subset of the trade issue, which is how it's been looked at before, both for WTO, but also for uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, trade agreement investment purposes. I think it has some distinctive characteristics on its own. I think we need to decide how best in the U.S. government to coordinate the efforts of Treasury, of Commerce, USTR, and State, all of whom have important responsibilities in this area. I was very pleased to see the, the excellent statement that came out of the G8 summit in Haligandam on this. Uh, I think it's an area where before I get to your WTO um, uh, suggestion, I'd really want to see how far we could run it inside the OECD, because I think they've done some very good work on the, uh, on the investment side. Uh, but I'd be open to finding ways, both inside the US and internationally, to look at this uh, subject on a more concerted, coordinated basis. Just to follow up, so many of the national laws uh, around the world are draped in national security. How would, how would a WTO or a, 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 an independent organization review square with the, the at least notional national security uh, focus? Well, I think as it does on trade and other issues, including if you take a look at the procedures inside the European Union and Commission, there is a carve out for national security, but there is an effort to make sure that it's a true carve out and mm -hmm. not an umbrella. Mm -hmm. And so I think that 
Richard's suggestion was not to suggest that any sovereign was going to give up its national security responsibilities, but rather to make sure that national security reviews were indeed national security reviews rather than broader investment reviews. I remember being with President Reagan in 86, 87, before the Exxon Florio Amendment passed in, in 88. And initially, um, the, the uh, proposal was to do investment reviews based on the national interest. President Reagan said, no way. And then the proposal was, how about economic interests of the U.S.? And he said, no, foreign investment's good for the U.S. And then finally, it was said, let's look at the national security implications. President Reagan said, I'm a national security guy. Of course, we have to protect the national security. That's an appropriate, narrow look. And that's the way I think these regimes should be set up. So I think you could actually move the direction that Richard's doing and have carve-outs not unlike the, the national security carve-outs that, that uh, exist today. I mean, I, I think it's, again, I think it's an interesting proposition. And the other thing I'd say, going back to a good question over here, um, the, the new law, as did the old law for CFIUS review, makes clear that CFIUS is um, a committee of last resort rather than first resort. I mean, it is a very powerful authority because if the president blocks a deal, um, that blocking of the deal is not reviewable in the courts. It also makes clear that if somebody doesn't come before the committee, and they should have, he can reach out even after the deal has closed and unwind it or modify it. It's a very powerful authority, and like any powerful authority, should be used very carefully. So the law makes quite clear that if defense or state or commerce, let's say export control policy, the Department of Homeland Security, or the Justice Department has existing authorities that they could use, not just antitrust mm -hmm. law, but more broadly, mm -hmm. to make sure that the investment is shaped the right way. They should use those, and this CFIUS authority should be exceptional. I think that would be a good model for others to look at, too. On the right and then over on the left. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mr. Prince. I'm Pranay Gupte, Mr. Kimmet. I live in Dubai at the moment, and in Dubai has been mentioned tonight, and so has China. This week, as you may be aware, there was a Dubai delegation in China, which was warmly welcomed, and Dubai committed itself to all kinds of investment, and it committed itself to all kinds of investment in India, among other things. Two related questions. One, to what degree are you actively looking for Middle East funds? As you know, there is a surplus of petrodollars there right now, something estimated to be about half a trillion dollars. And secondly, how would you compete with other economies, such as India, for example, where I was born and raised, uh, China, of course, uh, Thailand, and so on, Pakistan even, which are competing for the same funds? So to what is your message to them, that beyond investing in, in American debt, for example, what are the sectors of the American economy where you would actually want foreign direct investment? Thank you. Sure. Um, first, um, we want to make clear not just that we're open to foreign investment, but we have to actively seek foreign investment. Uh, there was an initiative started in the Commerce Department this spring called Invest in America, and the Commerce Department is now putting senior officials of their foreign commercial service into embassies for the specific purpose of helping foreign investors look for opportunities in the United States. In the past, most FCS, foreign commercial service people, were helping U.S. companies abroad, and they'll still do that. That's very important. But recognizing the tremendous job-producing potential of foreign investment, Commerce is now recognizing that it needs to get out there to Dubai, to Beijing, to Delhi or Mumbai to uh, compete uh, for that capital. What I would say is we're looking at opportunities. That is, U.S. companies are also looking at opportunities in China and India. I hope both those economies will continue to open their markets to investment. We're going to keep our market as open as we can. And we've never shied away from competition for uh, investment dollars uh, or uh, uh, other currencies. So I think the short answer is we need to get out there and market our openness, help companies look for particular opportunities. Uh, but we would expect them to look elsewhere. Um, and again, the more open those other markets are, including in China and India, not only does that create opportunities for investment in those countries, it creates opportunities for their companies, that is, Chinese and Indian companies, as they look to invest here in the United States. I might 
just go back to the point, we, we very much welcome investment from around the world, including the Gulf states. I've been to the Emirates several times uh, on, on a, for a number of reasons. We've had some very good discussions with them about investment opportunities here. Um, as I mentioned, there was an acquisition by the same sovereign wealth fund involved in Dubai ports just after Dubai ports, that is within six months, in which they bought a British company that had manufacturing facilities in the United States, including some who had sole source contracts with the U.S. Defense Department. That case went through in large measure because of what we had learned from Dubai ports and the good work being done by the company, both at the state level uh, and at the federal level. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Sergio Galvez, Sullivan Cromwell. Bob, first of all, you were um, rightly noting the, the great work of Congress in getting the law right, but I think you, it should also be recognized that you and the administration and Treasury, uh, under your leadership, did a great job in making sure that the law didn't get uh, written up in the wrong way. It was a very Thanks. good collaborative effort because it was in an environment where there was a, there could have been a tendency to go too far. And uh, I that didn't it. happen. So <laughs> congratulations on that. Uh, my question really relates to the uh, collateral impact of uh, positive collateral impact of foreign investment. Um, when we did the Argentine debt restructuring, one of the things that was most frustrating to bondholders was the fact that in a post privatization world, the Argentines didn't have any assets in the United States. To what extent do we measure the positive benefits uh, in terms of encouraging good, broader behavior by sovereigns by virtue of the fact that they are exposed, if you will, through their investments in the U.S.? And then secondly, to what extent does uh, our uh, open treatment of uh, their investment uh, discourage actions such as what we've seen recently in Bolivia and Venezuela of aggressive moves against our companies and of the withdrawal from uh, international dispute settlement arrangements like ICSID uh, as a way of resolving those disputes? Well, I think on that latter point, I think those countries um, are pursuing policies that run so counter to the economic rules of the road that have proved successful in all geographies that uh, they're very often hurting themselves in addition to, as you say, catching U.S. companies in the pinch. There's a lot that we try to do to help the U.S. companies directly, largely through our embassies and the, and the multi-agency staffs uh, who are there. Uh, but again, I think that going back to the first part of your question, um, I think it's not just investment in the United States, but it's investment throughout the world that sort of convinces sovereigns uh, just as it would convince companies that it's important for them to adhere to rules that support principles as general but as important as free and fair trade, flexible exchange rates, free flow of capital across borders. And although we in our National Security Review try to keep things fairly narrow and therefore we've not considered, for example, reciprocity a national security issue, Every investment decision takes place in a broader political context. And as the Chinese found out in the Sinook case, Chinese National Overseas Oil Company, which never came before CFIUS, you can run into troubles in the political sphere long before you come into the regulatory side. So I think that even people who might pay some attention to the regulatory details have to remember that all of this takes place uh, in a, a broader context. I think people who uh, run counter to that, that is try to see great opportunity here, close down opportunity there, or as you say, um, um, have assets deployed around the world, it would seem to me that teaches them the benefits of, of trying to play by these rules. Now, I may have missed your question a little bit, uh, particularly on the debt restructuring side, but uh, again, I don't think any of the things you mentioned argue for us being more closed I think that open investment and investment flows have been a real trump card for us, and we should continue to try uh, to encourage that. We have time for two or three more questions in the last row. David Braunschweig, Bear Stearns and Council on Foreign Relations. Um, 
You mentioned that reciprocity is not an issue to be considered when looking at uh, investments from a security perspective. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when comparing negotiations on trade and investment, reciprocity is indeed a factor often in trade. So uh, uh, particularly in the instance of um, sovereign wealth funds, uh, wouldn't it be a consideration to examine a potential investment on the basis of the acceptability and relevance of a symmetrical, reciprocal investment in the country of origin? Um, just to be clear, reciprocity is very important. Um, it's a major part of what we drive for in trade agreements generally, bilateral investment treaties in particular. Um, and it's a very, very important uh, policy and political factor. <clears throat> you are correct in saying my point only is that we have not brought reciprocity into that sort of court of last resort, that is the CFIUS review process that looks um, at national security questions. I might say that Europe is going a different direction in conversations that I had in Europe just last week it's quite clear that reciprocity, reciprocity is going to be a major factor in the investment review legislation that is being uh, considered there. So again, I think what I would say is we will continue to push for it. We want a level playing field for U.S. companies. Uh, but we do think the benefits of uh, inbound investment are strong enough for the United States uh, that even as we continue to push for reciprocity, if an investment makes sense here in the United States, uh, we would probably view that positively and also as a way to give us leverage to try to open that sector in another country. Down here in front. Uh, Henny Sender from the Wall Street Journal. Um, I was in San Francisco on Friday at a San Francisco Federal Reserve um, conference and somebody from Safeway Jin or what will become the China Investment Company was speaking. And he said that he was very blunt, and he said the message from the U.S. Treasury was, you are welcome to buy U.S. Treasuries, but not if it is at the expense of if you buy other things rather than U.S. Treasuries. Um, I was also in Kuwait in July. There is some concern there that their money is not welcome if they stray from U.S. Treasuries. I wondered if you could comment on that. Disconnect. Thank you. Sure. Um, um, I think that shows why we need not just to be at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, but we need to be back in Beijing and in Kuwait City uh, and elsewhere. Um, I certainly didn't get that message <clears throat> when I was in Beijing. Um, and also, uh, it seems fairly inconsistent with the record of purchases that the Chinese have made here, like Lenovo. Uh, buying the IBM personal uh, computer business, other acquisitions the Chinese have made through the years, some of which have come through CFIA, some of which have not. Also, their Greenfield and other operations like Hire, their white goods manufacturer, which has a, a good, very productive operation in South Carolina. Um, so again, um, certainly in the conversations that I had with the people, um, both directly involved in setting up the company and more broadly, I did get a sense from them, as I said, that they were looking for ways to generate returns without generating political controversy. Uh, but certainly, uh, we sent the message that uh, uh, investment from China was welcome. Kuwait, I find uh, uh, that a little bit unusual. Kuwait's been a, a, an investor here. It's been a sovereign fund holder for over four decades. Um, they have not done as many direct acquisitions as some of their neighboring countries. They have tended to do it <clears throat> with partners or through private equity or otherwise. Uh, but I've been with the head of both their sovereign wealth fund. I've been with their finance minister and others within the past six months. Um, that certainly wasn't, again, uh, the impression that I got. But to the extent you're hearing that, we take that seriously. Um, and one of the reasons we hope people in this audience and elsewhere help us get the message out that we're quite open. Uh, we have to make them understand that this new law uh, will continue to provide, I think, very good opportunity uh, for people to invest in the United States. But at the same time, uh, we'll never hesitate to protect our national security. Two more brief questions. First in front and then behind. 
Uh, Elizabeth Bramwell, Bramwell Capital. Um, I want to go back to national security and um, how the procedure actually works. And the reason for asking the question is that uh, within the last year, a Russian company, Ezraz, acquired um, Oregon Steel, roughly about a $2 billion deal. And you know, I really question having a Russian company buy a, an American steel company where there is proprietary technology, um, in this case, large-scale diameter pipe, and basically giving them access to trade shows and the overall uh, community in which they exist. And, um, you know, pipe of that kind is important for transporting oil from the oil sands in Canada. So I guess I'd like to know, you know, how the public is really protected, because on the other hand, you have the company you're wanting to sell at a higher price, the shareholders wanting to sell. You have the unions who are clamoring um, for jobs, and in this, comp in this case, the um, Russians promised to rebuild a plant. And then you sort of, you get Congress involved, you get the executive branch involved. How do you keep politics out of it? And I guess who really, who really reviews these things objectively from a national security point of view? Got it. Um, I can't um, go into to, uh, particular details on, on, on cases beyond <clears throat> information, again, that the companies have put in the public domain. But let me just say that, that the, the, the committee is made up of Treasury as the chair, the Defense Department, State Department, the Justice Department, <clears throat> the Commerce Department, the Department of Homeland Security, then the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Council of Economic Advisors, Office of Management and Budget. That's all? No, 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 no. I, <laughs> There, there's one more, and I'm going to get in trouble for for forgetting them. Um, but that that is sort of the statutory committee, and then um, depending on the matter, others transportation on an airline issue, energy can be brought in, uh, labor can be brought in on particular uh, matters, and <clears throat> essentially the cases are notified by the parties. Um, as soon as we receive the notification, indeed often before if we've got enough detail, it is sent immediately to the intelligence community. Uh, the intelligence community, <clears throat> by practice over the past oh, seven years and now by law, has to do uh, an intelligence assessment on every acquisition uh, to basically determine uh, if there are any national security considerations that raise uh, concern on the part of the intelligence community. And that's the intelligence community as a group, CIA, but then all the other members of the intelligence community. That uh, um, information, together with the information from the companies, then goes to each of the representatives on the committees. And then each of them does their internal agency work. Uh, they meet. Um, have discussions very often with the companies. Companies are very often called in. Um, and if there are any ad issues that are identified, um, <clears throat> very often there is put together something called a mitigation agreement where there might be some um, measures undertaken to have um, a, a U.S. subsidiary with an all-U.S. board, uh, certain requirements on security clearances, things of this sort. Again, I'm not going to any particular case, but at the end of the day, um, each of the members of CFIUS is asked to put his or her name on a line that says, we find no reason to believe that this case will adversely affect the national security. I think it's a pretty thorough process that at the end asks someone to exercise the most important single responsibility they have as a government official, and that is to say that the country will not be harmed by this going forward. Uh, again, now, not only do we have the professional security people who've been doing this for decades, you have much closer involvement um, of the um, uh, uh, political appointees in the departments and agencies, and then we notify the Congress immediately upon any decision that we have made, and the companies usually have been in touch beforehand. One last question, if it is very brief. Brief? Brief, yes. Brian O'Neill, uh, Mr. Secretary, in your opening remarks, you made reference to the four pending free trade agreements. Could you give us an update and uh, handicap the likelihood of passage of each? Oh, boy. Um, sorry, you always take one yeah, too many questions. Yeah, I, I was going to say. Sorry. 
I could keep my answer really brief. Uh, um, we think all four trade agreements um, are important um, uh, on the individual merits. There are three from Latin America, Panama, Colombia, um, and Peru, and then, of course, South Korea. Um, my recollection is that the process has begun on Peru. Uh, remember, these are still under uh, the, the fast track authority that's been expired, because, uh, that expired, but because of uh, the way they were concluded, it's moving according to a certain process. I think the administration remains of the view that all four are in the uh, economic interest of the United States. We're going to pursue them. Um, and uh, again, uh, if, if history is any guide, even major trade agreements like the U.S.-Canada trade agreement was, uh, the negotiations concluded actually this month, 20 years ago, um, uh, eventually went through the Congress. It was a long battle. Um, there were many uh, interests uh, um, um, at play. Um, but I think we're committed to getting all four through as quickly as we can. And uh, I'll say that we've had very good working relationships with uh, both the trade subcommittees and then finance and ways and means. We've got some differences. I think that good progress has been made. I probably won't handicap it for you, but I'll say we're committed to getting all four through. Secretary Kimmett, thank you very much for an illuminating, <laughs> very topical. And, uh, and thank all of you for coming. And again, I invite you to join, join us next Monday for Peter Mandelson.